So good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this discussion on building a circular and climate neutral economy uh, and to hear from a range of very interesting uh, stakeholders and policymakers on their reaction and thinking about the November circular economy package. My name is Martin Porter. Uh, I'm executive chair of CISL in Brussels, and it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this discussion and guide us through the next hour and a half which I hope you will all find extremely interesting, not least because we have an excellent lineup of speakers and participants, um, and indeed a very wide range of uh, people participating in the audience. Um, if we can go to the next slide, and I will briefly run through the agenda, you can see uh, from this that we have uh, an excellent lineup of um, speakers from all of the major EU institutions and then obviously also from different businesses and other stakeholder perspectives. So I hope that we will uh, both cover all of the relevant uh, and most pertinent and interesting uh, dimensions of this discussion um, and my job will also be to ensure that where we have questions from yourselves um, that we're able to put those to some of the participants and with my colleagues I will do my best to make sure that through the chat uh, any questions that come up, we try and answer those. And where we can't, obviously, we will do our best to, to ensure we can uh, come back to you and, and give you responses uh, after the discussion. So um, with that, my thanks, obviously, to all of the speakers and participants for joining. Um, and just by way of brief context and background, let me just um, refresh uh, our minds on the, the, the topic, uh, but also give you a little bit of background on uh, ourselves and the organization that, that we are. Um, so CLG Europe's uh, Materials and Products Task Force uh, was launched um, in 2021, as you can see, at COP26, and brings together um, a leading group uh, of businesses from a range of business sectors, all of whom are committed to driving forward this agenda um, and giving input and experience to policymakers and others on how best to, to do that. Um, they are obviously committed to doing this uh, on a Europe-wide basis um, and are collaborating with uh, the support of CRSL um, and indeed in the context also of the uh, Corporate Leaders Group Europe, the, the wider group of uh, companies uh, who are committed to doing uh, as much as they can on the climate agenda um, in, a, in a similar way. So this uh, task force um, has been active now since 2021 and has been uh, working to support this agenda and has produced a number of uh, reports and materials uh, in advance uh, of key events, notably obviously at the last COP uh, and in the last uh, year has produced uh, reports uh, such as that on the uh, digital product passport, materials which hopefully you have either seen already or which we can provide you uh, afterwards. Um, the aim of this group is obviously to engage with uh, policymakers, and this is uh, an event which brings some of them together with those policymakers and other stakeholders, as you see from the uh, agenda, um, and to, to have a public discussion about uh, the proposals that are on the table already uh, and to see how best to put them uh, into practice. So with that as introduction, uh, I'm delighted to say that we have as a first piece of our meeting today, um, a word uh, video uh, presentation from uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius, apologies for my pronunciation, um, and I would like to ask my colleagues uh, if we can play that before we get into our discussion. So hopefully the technology will now enable us to see that video. Good morning, everyone. And let me start by thanking you for your strong interest in and your support for our circular economy policy. From the very beginning of this mandate, the Commission proposes strategies or legislation, but we rely on the stakeholders to bring about real change on the ground. So even if I could not make it physically to your event today, I'm glad I can at least send you this message. And I know my colleagues will listen carefully to the issues and questions you will raise today and report back. 
2022 was a milestone year for circular economy. It began in the spring with the first package centered around eco-design, a broad, ambitious package, rethinking the concept of eco-design and expanding the rules to cover a far wider range of products and value chains. The second package in November took a different approach, focusing very closely on one value chain, in particular the EU rules on packaging and packaging waste. It also clarified the policy framework for bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics and included a proposal on carbon removal certification. You have asked for more details on the package from November. Well, I can say that it's a package that answers a need. And although recycling rates have continued to raise for the past 10 years, the waste we create has grown even faster. So if the current trends continue, plastic waste generation will raise by 46% by 2030 and 86% by 2040. We need to turn this around. And that's the aim of our most recent initiative. It provides a strong, harmonized and operational legal framework for packaging while also making the sector more efficient. The new regulation is designed to speed the transition from the linear take-make-dispose economic model towards a more circular economy. It's built around three main blocks. New targets for packaging waste reduction and reuse, sustainability requirements for economic operators with minimum targets for recycled material, and a big push to stimulate the uptake of recycled material. That should aid investment in the circular plastics economy, helping the recovery and recycling of plastic packaging waste. The environmental benefits should be significant and it should bring us a few more steps closer towards climate neutrality. The second part of that November package takes a closer look at the bioplastics framework. We see these products more and more proposed as alternatives to conventional plastic, but the situation is more complex than it looks. The framework we propose explains this complexity and sets out approaches to ensure overall outcomes that are positive for the environment. We do that in three ways. We start by clarifying the terminology. If you want to claim a material is, for instance, biodegradable or compostable, you have to explain how. Today, those claims and labels are often misleading. And we want to help consumers make choices they understand. Secondly, we want to ensure sustainable sourcing. There is no point in producing bio-based plastics unless the conditions of production are nature-friendly and pollution-free. And then thirdly, we need to ensure appropriate use. Biodegradable and compostable plastics should only be used in specific applications according to the principles of reduction, reuse and recycling. Above all, our aim is to ensure genuine benefits for the environment. That way we offer certainty to research, innovation and sustainable investment. Ladies and gentlemen, circular economy is a central commitment of the European Green Deal and there is plenty more work to do. Right now we are focused on delivering the remaining measures from the 2020 Circular Economy Action Plan. The Green Claims initiatives has been much in the news. And in the fight against greenwashing, it should prove a powerful tool. We are fine-tuning the initiative with a view to ensuring an ambitious and effective proposal. The plan is for adoption at the end of March, and I look forward to discussing that with you as well. Thank you again for this invitation, and I wish you fruitful discussions. Very good. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I think that sets the scene extremely well for our discussion here today. Um, and uh, obviously uh, enables us to think about all of the issues that, that were mentioned. Um, and we can immediately now, uh, I think, look at the follow-up work and the discussions that uh, are necessary, as the Commissioner indicated, um, with uh, three people who are actually uh, handling this um, on a day-to-day -day basis at the very heart of each of the main EU institutions. So I'm very happy that uh, I have with me now, I hope we'll um, soon see them on video, um, the uh, head of unit uh, dealing with waste and resources in the European Commission, Mattia Pellegrini. Um, I hope that we will also uh, see uh, Sirpa Peticainen 
um, or at least hear from her. I understand that she may not have the video, but Serpa, also welcome to you as well as Mattia. Um, and uh, Marta, um, uh, Marta Lima Basto from uh, the Ministry of Economic and Maritime Affairs in Portugal. So Marta, welcome to you. Um, it's great to have you all here with us. And indeed from each, as I said, of the three main institutions, you have a different perspective on this. Um, and we will begin by hearing from Mattia, who is working very closely, obviously, with the commissioner uh, in delivering on that agenda. So um, Mattia, he's already said a number of things about your, your work and your agenda. Um, but please follow up and, and give us more details and set out what you're now working on and looking for indeed from uh, the, the stakeholders who are involved in this discussion here with you today. So the floor is yours. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation. Indeed, I mean, we are working at the moment uh, on many legislation and, um, and all this legislation are around the circular economy and the contribution indeed that circular economy can also give uh, to climate change because indeed one of the, the ways to decarbonize is actually to make sure uh, that um, products are not done in a linear way but rather in a circular way because that's, is, I mean, when you look at then uh, CO2 emissions, uh, there are clear uh, benefits. As you know, that uh, type of logic of uh, uh, designing uh, circular products uh, started with the batteries uh, regulation, which was the, the first uh, time that the Commission has actually regulated the entire uh, life cycle uh, of a product, of a very important product, that indeed if it's not uh, circular, it may, I mean, we're talking about a, the, a lot of the use of batteries in order to decarbonize, but indeed if they're not designed in a circular way, uh, and um, then you may really have uh, negative uh, impacts on the production stage of the battery. So that's the reason why the Commission has set out a number of sustainability requirements, by the way, also carbon threshold in the batteries uh, uh, regulation. And that was the first one done in December 2020, which now, after two years of intense negotiation, has come to a, an agreement by the co-legislator, and they should be published uh, in the coming months at the latest uh, before the summer uh, break. I mean, now it's a matter of correcting the text. And then after that, the Commission has come up, as you know, with the first uh, circular economy package, and um, which was in particular about uh, the, uh, um, the, European, the sustainable product regulation. So really how we design products in a sustainable way. By the way, you were mentioning, Martin, that you have done work on the digital product passport. As you know, this is also one of the component, both of the batteries regulation and of the, of the sustainable product regulation. You have a batteries passport foreseen in the batteries regulation and a, and a product passport foreseen in the sustainable product regulation, which is a transformation of the old ego design legislation into a, a type of legislation which takes into account not only energy efficiency but the full sustainability of a product and more recently indeed which was i think is the main topic of today's discussion we came out with the second circular economy package where we are focused on the on packaging packaging waste and indeed this has been a really a, a transformative approach because indeed uh, not only because again we have by the way what you have noticed probably is that constantly we have reviewed the, where they were existing directive and transformed them into regulation. It's a very important point because that means that um, when we're talking about sustainability requirements, they will apply directly to economic operators. So, so that is the, is the big change also with this um, approach of regulation. And indeed, it will be really, I mean, important that companies then comply with these um, sustainability requirements. But I think in packaging, we have taken uh, even an additional step, uh, which was, and I think the Commission referred to that, is that for the first time, we have regulated what are called the two higher level uh, of the waste hierarchy. So the prevention of waste and or from packaging and also the reuse. So as you have seen, we have set out for the first time a mandatory reuse targets for certain sectors. But that is also a big novelty compared to, to really the, the, the approach until now. And of course, then we have... Uh, also mandated the uh, uh, important things like uh, recyclability of packaging by 2030. So there will be a system by which if, uh, if the packaging is, does not comply with a certain performance class, then will be out of the market in 2030. So that's uh, at the moment, just to give you an idea, one third of the packaging uh, 
is, is considered, I mean, according to different studies, is considered to be designed in a way which cannot be recycled at the end of the process. So with that measure, we will fix that problem. And also then there is a problem of uh, non-performance of a specific one sector, which is uh, the, the, the plastic uh, sector in terms of packaging, in the sense that their recycling rates are very low. So in order to boost the recycling rates uh, only for plastic packaging, the Commission has put forward uh, uh, mandatory recycled content. Uh, it's an increased level, but indeed, uh, mm, and uh, as you have seen, we have divided in two types of um, uh, mm, packaging, the packaging which is in contact with food or sensitive in general, and the packaging, of course, which is non-sensitive. And of course, for the non-sensitive packaging, you can have much higher targets uh, in terms of uh, uh, recycled content and um, and and also what is important maybe as a final point uh, we have a lot of measures about uh, labeling because indeed also labels can um, again I mean if we want to improve a recycling operation a reuse operation you need uh, uh, labels which can guide the consumer so there will be at least three sort of labels one on uh, um, uh, sorting instructions one on reuse and one on uh, recycled content so that uh, they, they will allow and they will guide the consumer. So, for example, when you sort at home, the idea is that you will have the same pictograms in the, rece in the receptacles, so in your bin or bags, and the same pictogram in the packaging. So you will not make uh, any mistakes. And uh, because, as you know, especially for complex packaging, sometimes you wonder yourself as a consumer, which bin should I put it? Uh, so that will increase both uh, the collection rate and the purity level, because there is also an issue of purity of contamination. So that's Again, we lead to higher recycling rates. Higher recycling rates means less primary raw materials, and that means less CO2 impacts. By the way, the last point I wanted to make, if you look at our impact assessment, especially on recycled content for plastics, as you know, plastic is made out of petrol. Uh, so we have estimated that with our targets on recycled content for plastics, how much imports of, of, of fuel uh, can be, of petrol, can be avoided. So that's uh, not only you have a CO2 positive impacts, but also in the current context of uh, um, energy dependency and uh, diversification of sources and more strategic autonomy, will also bring that element uh, in relation to, 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 to the imports of oil, which are needed for the production of, uh, of primary plastics. I mean, there is many other things in the proposal, it's a very big one, but I think I don't want to take it uh, too long. But of course, um, if there are any questions or reactions, then I'm happy to, to take it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mattia. Well, your last point, um, let me uh, sort of follow up and reiterate that um, for those of you who are in our audience, uh, please feel free to use the chat function in order to put questions and we will do our best to collate those and put them uh, to, to Mattia, to Marta, to Sirpa uh, at the end of their initial uh, contributions. Um, and as I said, if we don't get a chance to do that now, we'll do it uh, afterwards as best we can. Um, there's a huge amount that, that uh, we can get into there, Mattia. Um, and I guess the best way of starting that is to maybe turn to, to Sirpa and to see what uh, her initial reaction and maybe what she anticipates and is the reaction of the European Parliament more broadly um, on, on this agenda. So Sirpa, uh, welcome. I hope you can hear me and it's always a pleasure to have you with us. So um, if you can hear me, the floor is now yours. Seems... Thank you. Um, oh, you can't. Thank you very okay. much. Super. Welcome. Uh, and I hope that you can hear me as well. All very, always a uh, pleasure to work with you, Martin, and very happy to be uh, here um, in, in this session. Okay, uh, about these uh, reactions, I think that there's a lot of good and actually this kind of a paradigm changing in uh, this proposed regulation. One is, of course, this hierarchy that was first time put in place in, in batteries, as we heard by, uh, from Mattia, but uh, also now it is extended. It is the extended producer liability that puts the reusability at the first place. And of course, this is something that has uh, raised uh, worries and reactions so already, so the parliament needs to be very tough on uh, this. 
Then uh, when it comes to choose when to uh, reuse and uh, whether there should be a compulsory uh, recycled content or not, what I'm actually looking forward very much, and that is under the uh, environment, DG environment also, is the indicator settings. And that would need to be the whole life cycle analysis so that we can actually see where and how the reuse can be extended, how to pre prefer certain materials, plastics are good in some places, wood in some places, uh, then maybe even glass uh, as a container if you can create a longer term and metals longer term uses. But to really get uh, the sort of a uh, sort um, uh, sort of materials right, uh, this is what need uh, is is needed, um, and uh, hopefully this kind of a uh, BEF uh, LCA uh, uh, it could be clear uh, uh, and uh, should be could be fortified in the parliament. Um, then what I'm lacking here and what I'm missing. Uh, is uh, the whole target, and I. Uh, this is not uh, to, to blame the commission, because I know how hard uh, this discussion is, both in the parliament, and not to talk about the council and uh, the commission itself. But what we really would need uh, to have is this kind of a complete indicator set, that, uh, set plus then uh, not only indicative, um, but uh, the science-based targets on re a reduction of the resource use. As we all know, we are talking about tenfold improvement in resource efficiency. And what I'm very uh, afraid, be it banking or other sectors, is that we take the sidetracks um, and end up in, in some solutions that are better than but not effective and actually not helpful of getting to higher targets, but preventive on, um, on that. And uh, I, I could have a long list of examples, uh, both in backing and in, in other areas, what that can mean. But to avoid this, I think that this ambition level should be clearly stated out and it should be binding. Then about um, the whole measuring system uh, is still, as I mentioned, uh, lagging uh, behind, and that has, of course, the uh, the, the uh, connections with other re uh, regulations like taxonomy, sustainable finance in general, uh, about our about our uh, budgets and uh, about then of course uh, Eurostat and uh, how we measure the resource efficiency in our member states. Then about measuring and this is quite clearly in the waste framework directive but also here I think that we clearly should have all points of measurements to really get the information about how effective the system is. And that was very unfortunate that um, the last time when we had the, the waste framework directive in the parliament, we were not able to do it. First, you would need to, uh, of course, measure the collected uh, materials. Then second point, you should uh, measure the amount that co goes to reuse and then on the other hand, on uh, uh, recycling facilities. Then you would need to get the measurement, what uh, comes out of the recycling facilities. And there, as I've learned, there's a quite a, lo a lot of uh, 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 loss uh, nowadays, so the actually recycling processes are not effective. And we should go there on the root causes, and quite often that is materials and the collection systems uh, that uh, uh, cause the problems. And the fourth point should be then uh, actually what is on real use when after the material is uh, uh, reprocessed. For example, in Finnish case, 
we do collect uh, plastics pretty well. Uh, we do uh, reprocess it pretty well. But actually, what gets out only about half is used, and the rest is incinerated. And uh, uh, we actually shouldn't and couldn't tolerate that kind of a lapse. And about uh, the effective reuse of the plastic, so that means in, in, in real packing um, is close to 4% in Europe at the moment, not to be on the fifth. Then uh, to pick up a couple of words of warning also, what I hope that both the waste regulation and here could be uh, clarified um, is uh, the chemical recycling. It uh, should be last resort, and I'm very happy that uh, the, the, re, uh, the reuse is preferred uh, and uh, mechanical uh, recycling thereafter. But as we know, there's uh, really ineffective close to uh, fossil fuel industry, basically turning turning the majority of the material to be a fuel or to be incinerated, and this should not be categorized or understood as chemical recycling. It should be something uh, that we yet does not do, uh, exist, but we know that the uh, uh, the systems are on the pipeline already, so that means that the, the regain of the molecules, the plastic molecules, are above 70. So it is really effective and uh, really clean and reusable. And uh, that then would sort of set the uh, bar and the states right for the, uh, for the uh, future. Then again, word of warning about bio. Biomaterials are not always better. And this is in single use something I sort of arrest my case because uh, without this kind of a proper path, LCA, one can't uh, tell is it better to have single use plastics uh, or reusable metal forks and knives in uh, uh, fast food systems or wooden. Uh, um, it, uh, utilities, uh, utilities on uh, uh, on use, and there I'm afraid we are just sort of lobbying a bit, like in buildings, to prefer one or the other route over the others, and that might not always be the case. If you cut the forest in China to produce forks and knives, no one basically uses because they are packed on the back of three. And quite often you need only fork or you need only spoon, spoon if that is a reasonable use of the resources. So there's a lot of uh, stuff left on, on, on detail to look close. To conclude, I'm just uh, wishing and hoping that the Commission could still come up with the ways uh, more clear uh, and then uh, uh, the, as above mentioned, uh, targets and the measurement and the science-based approach on, on here to, 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 to give the regulation as, as, uh, uh, as a last remaining gift to the parliament out of this very good work this commission has been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Serpa, very much. I think that's a, a great set of points that you raise. And obviously, I hope I'll come back to uh, Mattia, certainly, uh, with some of those ranging from the importance of measurement and metrics, which goes to the heart of this, mm -hmm. obviously alignment with other policies and regulation, some specific points, uh, for example, about chemical recycling, which we might turn to, um, and uh, the link at the end, maybe to even broader issues like trade, uh, and I dare say even industry um, uh, strategy and plans, given what is going to be published today by the European Commission indeed. Um, with that, uh, and I don't want to preempt, obviously, what uh, Marta is going to say. Um, Marta, welcome, and uh, look forward to hearing what your perspective is on this. Uh, obviously, working at a national level, but in uh, the context of the European uh, Union as a whole and the Council uh, work that you're engaged in. So, look forward to hearing from you, and then we'll come back to some questions. I've got some uh, online as well, which I'll turn to. But um, Marta, um, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. 
Let me start by greeting the other participants in this event and thanking the CLG Europe Task Force on Climate Neutral and Circular Materials and Products for hosting the event and inviting the Directorate General for Economic Activities from Portugal. For the sake of clarity, let me tell you that this Directorate General is a public organization within the Ministry of Economy and Maritime Affairs. And we are involved among many other competencies in the formulation of public policies uh, within the framework of circular economy, particularly uh, with regard to waste management and extended producer responsibility. But we do this obviously in coordination with the, uh, the Ministry of Environment, who had the lead of many of these negotiations within the European Council. But we all have in mind that circular economy is an approach that aims to keep resources in a productive circuit for longer and consequently including measures and actions that extend the lifetime of materials to the limit if possible and enhancing their value. The transition, it, it's not easy from a linear <laughs> economy to a circular model. It involves more than simply uh, recycling. Uh, we do it as much as possible, but there are, uh, there are other areas where we can, can act on. The eco-design of products, including the phasing out and the elimination of hazardous substances, and we are uh, negotiating that in the European uh, Council, as it was already said by the Commission. Uh, we have strategies to promote reuse, remanufacturing and repair of products, uh, restrictions on the single use of products, combating premature obsolescence and limiting the destruction of unsold durable uh, goods. Also strategies that stimulate new consumption patterns and we cannot uh, uh, left out the empowering consumers uh, by providing reliable information to enable them to make the smart choice or the sustainable choice when each and every one of us goes shopping. <laughs> so um, this uh, second European circular economy action plan and the, the proposals that are within it focus actions on those resource intensive sectors where the potential for circularity is higher. Without any doubt, both the packaging and plastic sectors are two of these uh, such cases. And I'll be focusing on the packaging and packaging uh, waste. Uh, we are obviously committed to contribute for the minimization of unnecessary packaging on the market to ensure that consumers can opt for usable packaging as well as to work on levels with clear information to support effective uh, recycling. Uh, the, the key actions that are foreseen in this uh, proposal are focused on preventing packaging waste, increasing reuse, refilling and making all packaging recyclable. The proposal in, in itself uh, addresses three major constraints identified already in the impact assessment. Uh, the increase in the generation of packaging waste accentuated by new consumption habits. We've heard it here before that as much as we recycle <laughs> the consumption, uh, it, it's much higher and so it, it's not enough. Then barriers to use, to reuse and recycling, mainly due to the non-use of eco-design rules when conceiving the packaging and low quality of secondary raw materials, mainly plastic materials, due to the need to, for greater investment in technology. Uh, the measures advocated in this proposal are expected to contribute to a more efficient use of raw materials and thereby to promote the competitiveness and resilience of enterprises, while also enabling citizens to reduce consumption costs, which sometimes is debatable by preferring reusable uh, over single-use packaging which results in an extension on packaging uh, lifetime. In a prevention and circular perspective the proposal includes uh, besides uh, some measures and, and targets also ambitious requirements with a view to the elimination of over packaging 
improve recyclability, minimize the complexity of a packaging composition, increase incorporation of secondary uh, raw materials in phase out of hazardous substances to promote uh, reuse, all this without compromising the food safety and quality uh, of standards. We in Portugal, our collective system that is licensed uh, for the management of packaging waste already includes some of the concerns addressed by the proposal, in particular by means of using uh, eco modulation of financial benefits that rewards or penalizes uh, uh, fillers or packers depending on whether or not they implement business strategies to prevent the generation of packaging waste and facilitate recycling at the end of its life uh, cycle. Uh, we've had a study on reuse carried out in 2022 by three Portuguese associations in the mineral water, beer and non-alcoholic uh, drinking sectors. It was supposed to be to study a uh, self-regulation uh, model for this, but as the Commission was coming up with this proposal, the model waited for the targets that are going to, to be set at the end of this uh, negotiation. But for example, in the water subsector, the amount of reusable packaging placed on the market is relatively low, not to say very low, and is essentially uh, limited to the hotels, restaurants, and catering uh, sectors. Also in the juices and soft drinks, it's even lower. Uh, all reusable packaging is also distributed through these, these channels. And the beer and cider uh, subsector is, has the highest supply of reusable packaging with 45% in equivalent consumption units. Uh, the case of natural and spring waters is one of those that um, raises some concerns. Uh, and the reuse of packaging is quite a challenge, given that the natural and spring water filling units have to be located very close uh, to the respective collection points. And it, it's not easy to, to do that since transport in bulk of these waters is not allowed and jeopardizes its uh, properties. And the same happens with some wines, especially those in uh, recognized uh, regions. So, some of the targets in this uh, proposal <clears throat> are a challenge and are not yet clear how we're going to do it. And we have some difficulty in assessing the scope for the water and wines covered, for, for example. Nevertheless, and more from the perspective of uh, reuse um, in the targets for 2030 and 2040 will certainly require investment from the companies. The implementation and operation of a packaging reuse system implies several changes in the facilities of the producers and the logistics and transport networks. Carrying out these changes is time consuming, it's expensive, and although we are, we are all committed to the, to the targets, we also have to think of the impact it has on, on companies. Uh, the involvement of the sales channels with increased circulation of reusable packaging, it will be necessary to allocate space at points of sale and distributors for storage and of used packaging. And space allocation uh, is not always abundant, as, as we know. <laughs> uh, it's one of the main barriers to the rise of reusable packaging and has a cost in, it, in itself. At the end of the value chain, these costs will be passed on to the consumer. And it's essential to ensure that these investments are cost efficient and proportion, proportionate to the environmental contribution. And finally, to mention consumer involvement. Uh, consumer participation is also one of the critical success factors for all these, these policies. Um, we, well, the Commission is proposing to harmonize mark, uh, marking and labeling of, of packaging in line in what the containers for selective disposable. And we'll see how this works. We've had for the last years uh, uh, major campaigns to educate the consumer 
to separate the, everything, the glass from the paper, from the plastic, to put them in certain containers. It's yellow or it's blue or it's green. It depends on the member state. Uh, yes, harmonize would be good, but it takes uh, another extra effort to re-educate the consumer to, to do it. Uh, so these are some of the concerns we have. I hope it has been useful and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, you raise uh, a number of topics there, which I'm sure are going to be part of the council discussions and no doubt in the parliament as well. Maybe if it's OK, uh, Mattia, I'll come back to you with some of those points and a couple of questions that we've had in the chat. And then I'll let yourself, uh, Sirpa and Marta, uh, address the, the, the questions together. But I mean, she raises some practical challenges that, that businesses and others face. Um, and one of those in particular, I guess, is an investment challenge. How do, how do we incentivize the investment by companies in this? Uh, and then the role of the consumer. So there are three broad areas, I guess, which would be interesting for you to, to react to. Um, and maybe some specific questions, if you can bear these in mind. Uh, we've got a question of how the reuse and refill targets will work, um, particularly with an emphasis on effective reverse logistics. Um, so that's one question we have. Um, that's from a, a retail perspective, I think, in particular. Um, secondly, on chemical recycling, is it being considered as an option for hard to recycle plastics? Um, and thirdly, a question essentially from the hotel, uh, restaurant catering uh, perspective, uh, the banning of single use packaging and the targets associated, how are the, the, the difficulties associated with that for that sector being considered and mitigated? You don't have to answer all those questions, but if, if one or other of you can address them, that would be great. But first of all, Mattia, uh, maybe reacting to what Marta said and maybe some of what uh, Sirpa said first off, and then I'll come to Sirpa and Marta again. Yeah, so um, indeed, Martin, so thank you very much, uh, both for the, um, I mean, summing up uh, what Marta and, uh, and Mrs. Pitigale Pitigalian said, I mean, and indeed also for the specific uh, questions, which are linked, by the way, to the points made by the Member of Parliament and also by the representative of Portugal. So as, I say, as you said yourself, uh, I would like to start with that. This is the beginning of, uh, if I can put it like in a football game, it's the beginning of a match um, in the sense that now you have 90 minutes to play because the commission proposal is only when the football match starts. And as you said, and then there is the co-decision process, which has already started, especially in the council. There has been already a number of working parties meetings. And the parliament has now just appointed the, the, the rapporteur, Mrs. Ries, in the Envy Committee, uh, which is also familiar with the committee. I mean, both Mrs. Pitikainen uh, was uh, indeed the rapporteur for the first uh, package in 2018, back in 2018, so she's very familiar with our legislation. But also Mrs. Ries, uh, she's familiar because she was the rapporteur for the SUP directive, so she knows uh, partially, I mean, the SUP was much smaller compared in terms of single-use packaging compared to the overall uh, packaging proposal we have now. But indeed, uh, it's also good that uh, a number of, of members of parliament which are familiar with packaging are also uh, now addressed, I mean, still there and, and engaging in this issue. Uh, and indeed, uh, I will start with the first point, which is the logistics, which was raised by Mrs. Pitikainen. It was raised now by you in summing up the question, Martin, also understanding the chat and the economic cost, as you said. Indeed, uh, the Commission has assessed that. Uh, um, the, 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 our supporting studies have now been published on our impact assessment, uh, which take over also the reuse part. And indeed, that's the reason why, for example, as you have seen on reuse, there is an exemption based on turnover, number of square meters, uh, in order to at least exempt uh, uh, small and medium enterprises. I mean, you may, I mean, we took inspiration by the German law. You may mm, find a better exemption, and I think the co decision process is there to see if uh, maybe it needs to be improved. But indeed, we're fully aware that uh, one thing is to implement a reuse system for McDonald's, just to give an example, or, or Starbucks. Another thing is to implement a reuse system for the corner shop uh, down on my road. Well, indeed, uh, it may imply the complete redesign of the shop. I mean, in the, in the, in the, mm. and in the, uh, or, or for example, for a small restaurant. So that's, uh, um, I think, uh, the, 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 
the first point. So we have foreseen an exemption for small and medium enterprises. Uh, and then the second uh, uh, point, indeed, uh, um, we have seen uh, that the only way to reduce cost, uh, and that is very important because there's a lot of focus also, Marta was focusing a lot on the targets, uh, um, but if you look at our proposal, it's not only about the targets, so there is uh, the targets for reuse, and there is also specifically for dining in, and these things, there is even a ban of, of single use. But uh, um, the, uh, I think all of that, especially for uh, the, 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 the takeaway, for example, from the Orega sector, there we insisted a lot that this will also depend the success model and also the lowering of the cost on having in place a, 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 what we call a reuse system. So, for example, the Commission has now foreseen the empowerment to come up and harmonize the, the standards and the formats of the products, because indeed uh, you can imagine, and this links also to the question of Mrs. Pidikain and also of the chat about the life cycle assessment. Uh, indeed, uh, not only as Mrs. Pidikain uh, makes sense to do a life cycle assessment, we're even obliged under the West Framework Directive to, in order to impose reuse, to do a life cycle assessment, covering and to compare recycling with reuse. Uh, and indeed, uh, if you have, the, imagine the beer bottles, if you have like here in Belgium, many different formats, basically every single producer in Belgium has a different uh, uh, shape of bottle and a different color, of course, then the reverse logistic will be impossible because then you will have to basically have a return back to each producer. So of course, why Germany was a success model, because in Germany you have mainly three formats of beers. And then, of course, what has happened is that uh, I was visiting one uh, beer producers in Germany. Uh, two thirds of the beer that they were reused there, rewashed in order to be reused, were beers of the competitors, simply just with a different, uh, you take out the label. So that is an important point. It is true that it may have, especially if you don't have harmonized formats, may have very high cost and not necessarily positive environmental impacts. But if you create the, uh, the, the so-called framework condition, then we believe that they may be uh, environmental uh, benefits. Um, then the uh, indeed the question uh, which uh, uh, on consumer indeed that is essential because indeed uh, I was yesterday actually at a breakfast meeting organized by the um, uh, U.S. ambassador with I don't know how many members of parliament so I, again I understood how important is this proposal uh, and indeed um, there are now as you know in, in the French system from 1st of January 2023 is, uh, is obligatory to have reuse in the in the in the Eureka sector. It's a national law, and indeed it appears from what was shown yesterday that uh, indeed uh, there are uh, uh, interesting primary data. So with some of them, they show high consumption of water, uh, a shift from uh, paper to plastics. So all these things, of course, are not in our impact assessment. Because at that time, we have used what we call secondary data. We didn't have primary data because this is only taking place now. Of course, now the commission, and I understand there is a number of studies ongoing, uh, is ready to, 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 to look into that. But uh, I also would like to, to, um, to stress that, as you have seen, for the Eureka sector in particular, the reuse target uh, on the takeaway is rather a low one because, indeed, we understand that uh, uh, I mean, you, you will need time to, to, uh, to create uh, that. Uh, then there was a specific point on, uh, and I will come at the end of your point also, Martin Consumer, uh, I will touch first the last point on chemical recycling. Um, so the, again, this we have been hearing a lot uh, that uh, we should be more open and recognize upfront chemical recycling. Um, uh, there, I mean, my reply is that, uh, you know, we cannot do it upfront. Uh, because we need to set up a first, so we need two steps. The first one is to set uh, and to agree with the co-legislator on rules on recycled content. So as you know, we now have um, targets, as I explained, for three different uh, categories, uh, sensitive uh, packaging, non-sensitive and beverage bottles. Once there is the final proposal, the commission will come up with an harmonized methodology on how you measure recycled content, for example, in a bottle. And once you know the harmonized methodology, then of course, uh, we will also, in this harmonized methodology, say how you can, what you can count in, uh, in, in your, uh, whether you can count only mechanical recycling, also chemical recycling. Of course, I think it is clear, I mean, although it will have to be done at the later stage, that when mechanical recycling is leading back to another polymer that can be used, as uh, Mrs. Pirigani was saying, in again in the product or in packaging, of course, that is a, 
is a typical recycling operation, but as you know, chemical recycling also results in, in fuel, in energy. So that's, uh, of course, that part which is fuel cannot be counted because it's not, uh, I mean, it's waste to energy. It's not uh, a, a recycling operation, but all of that will have to be discussed in secondary legislation, but indeed, the, 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 with this recycle content target, and especially for flexible packaging, uh, because I, I didn't understand the question why it was on art packaging. Normally, chemical recycling will be even more needed for the type of plastics which currently cannot be dealt by mechanical recycling. So that's a, um, so it's a complementary tool. But also, the last point I'm going to make on chemical recycling, we have the latest uh, GRC study, which clearly shows that when you compare mechanical recycling to chemical recycling, I think even uh, uh, even the, the producers or, or the industry investing in chemical recycling will recognize that indeed in terms of CO2 emission, which was also the title linked to packaging of this um, I mean proposal uh, or this event, the webinar, uh, indeed uh, um, we should not forget that uh, there is no difference, in, there is no, no comparison in the sense that uh, in mechanical recycling is really outperforming, I mean it's really the best technology, but indeed it cannot work for all type of plastic, so indeed uh, you will have to look in a complementary way. And the last point on consumer, indeed, as you said, Martin, as also some of the speakers said, it is essential. That's the reason why we're thinking about the labels. Also want to reassure Martha, we're not thinking about, uh, at least, uh, we never thought about harmonizing colors. Uh, we know that there are different colors, but you can, even you can present still the different colors of the beans and the plastic bags, but you can still have a pictogram which is the same everywhere in Europe, which can uh, then it will be easy for packaging companies placing their products in Europe because they will only have one pictogram to put uh, wherever in Portugal or in Italy or in, in or, 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 or in Ireland or in another country. And the, 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 and the same one uh, in the bin or in the bags, uh, independently of the color. So indeed, uh, it is true that uh, uh, there was a certain point at political level uh, even reference to the possibility to have uh, an harmonized uh, color system, but this is not our final proposal. The, the final proposal is about an harmonized uh, pictogram system, which are proved to be very effective, and I will conclude with that, uh, about educating consumers, because the Nordic countries, uh, they have done it, it's called the Nordic pictogram. It started in, 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 in Denmark, and then it was uh, um, uh, moved to Sweden, uh, Finland, and, uh, and uh, Norway. And he has proved that they have increased enormously the collection uh, rates. So they have the same pictograms in these four markets. They didn't change the, their system of uh, the, the, the color schemes, but indeed uh, by having the same pictograms, and it, it was work even the design of the pictograms together with industry and all these things. And uh, so that's, I think, is an important point uh, that I wanted to make. And indeed, uh, uh, the same applies to the label for reuse, and the same applies to the label for recycled content. Of course, consumer, for us, the best way to educate consumer will be via this label. Of course, then we will also have to ensure that there are uh, communication campaign. I think this proposal, uh, in any case, uh, needs be, to be accompanied at a certain stage by the communication campaign. But indeed, it's a proposal which is, uh, I mean, I can tell you that out of the proposal of the DG Environment, we looked at the numbers, and it was from the SUP directive that the DG Environment did not have in, in our own uh, website uh, so many clicks uh, on the web page of, of this proposal. I mean, uh, I think 80,000, 90,000 90, people have downloaded the, within an hour or two of or the, the, from the publication in November, uh, the, the proposal. So it's clearly there is a, even citizens are interested in that. So I think indeed the consumer education would play an important role. Fantastic, thank you very much. Very um, some detailed and comprehensive answers, which means to follow your football analogy just for this meeting, we're close to the end of the first half, but I'm going to allow some extra time just to ensure that we uh, are able to hear from Sirpa and Marta again, because I think they may want to just react to some of what you've said, as well as offer some opinions. So uh, with your um, uh, permission, we'll go on just for a little bit longer before we turn to the second half. Um, first of all, to Sirpa, assuming you're still uh, there. I can't see you, but hopefully you can hear us. Uh, and then to Marta. But uh, a couple of minutes or so of reaction to that, Sirpa, if you'd like. If not, I'm going to pass straight to Marta, who definitely is still here. Marta, Thank you. you kick off, and if Serpa can hear us, she'll, she'll let us know, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, well, I think the world comes down to a question of balance between uh, the commitment we all have with the final objective of 
reducing waste and being more sustainable in Europe, leading by example even to to other parts of the world that need to to make an effort like we are doing. Uh, it's a question of balance between these commitments, these targets, and the burden we impose on companies to change their strategies, to adapt to new packaging, to new logistics, to new spaces. Um, and I, I'm glad to hear the Commission uh, on the SMEs concern because, as you know, 99% of our companies are SMEs and it's more difficult uh, on them than on the big companies, uh, naturally. And uh, when we try to harmonize things, we have to think of the pros and cons of, of everything. You can harmonize the, the packaging, but then you cannot hamper the, uh, the need for companies to innovate and to distinguish themselves, sometimes through packaging or uh, the materials they use or colors or, or, or whatever. So it, I think it all comes down to this. On the we ourselves here in Portugal have to balance what we our position in the council between the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of um, Environment, um, and I think it's it's the same in every member state. We have uh, our concerns. The companies have their concerns, and it all comes down to the, the cost that these changes impose on them. And also on consumer. Here in, in Portugal, the Ministry of Economy also has a consumer policy. And I think that uh, empowering con consumers and uh, information is essential for this change because it's in our hands, all of us, when we, we make the choice. And sometimes um, we see studies that consumers are willing to pay more for a sustainable product. Not always true. So we try to <laughs> uh, to educate consumer and make the smart choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. And I think um, Sirpa, if you're unmuted, do you want to offer us some last thoughts on this before we pass to the next uh, half? <clears throat> yes, uh, very happily. I'm sorry about the previous. Uh, I forgot to unmute myself. No problem. Um, I think that this is excellent discussion, firstly. Secondly, um, uh, I understand very well the Martha's point on uh, costs, but what I would like to underline on, on here is that we should have always in our um, <clears throat> impact assessment of legislation the cost of non-action. And we all know that uh, if we do not act now, um, and especially the circular economy is so big part of it that the costs are going to be uh, via climate change and other factors at least tenfold the COVID-19 costs uh, roughly after 10 or 15, 15 years from now. So uh, this is just not a question whether we do it or not, but how to do it. Then uh, just to um, notions and this is indeed the product passport that is a story of itself uh, that i hope that maybe we could organize a separate session because there are various ways uh, how to organize it concretely and uh, the model <clears throat> that has been proposed by the commission is pretty open and what i'm afraid is that we might create systems that are uh, not uh, interoperable in the future and so we might uh, uh, want to choose a bit uh, tighter uh, tighter uh, view on, on here and last but not least and this is the competitive side at uh, the europe's ability to kick off the chase somewhere else and this is their consent directive we tried to make some improvements here in the parliament it is essential, it's vital that the packing is part of it, like the whole circular economy principles, so that you can not uh, introduce, uh, produce or import goods that are not upgradable, that are not uh, repairable, that are not reusable, 
and that uh, are not uh, recyclable on the highest uh, value of the material. And by that way, if Europe is demanding this in the global markets, we all know that the <clears throat> industries in, in, in China and USA will change to, they will not leave our markets because, you know, because of these requirements. And that um, itself then speeds up the uh, global cha uh, chains. So we are even in a much bigger role of importers than we tend to think in, in everyday politics. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. That's an excellent final point on the global uh, dimension of this and trade uh, related issues too. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, thank you, Sirpa and Matia. I understand both of you need to, to leave now. I hope Marta can uh, remain as um, indicated and maybe offer some perspective at the end of our next uh, session. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Matia and Sirpa, for your contributions. Uh, wonderful as ever to see you and to have you involved in this. And we look forward to remaining in touch. I'm sure many of the participants, as well as ourselves, will be in contact with you frequently over coming months as this discussion continues. So thank you and uh, have a good rest of day. We'll uh, continue to, to be in touch with you, as I say. Good to see you again. So let's pass over. I'm going to keep using Matthias uh, analogy of the football match to the second half. Um, here we're going to hear from businesses who are at the um, uh, sort of cutting edge of this uh, in, in real life, in practice, um, and uh, hear what their perspectives are before we also hear from uh, a couple of NGOs who are also working on this issue. Um, so with that, let me pass over, first of all, uh, to Katerina, and then we'll pass to Ramon. Uh, Katerina, as you can see, works for Rockwell. I'm sure she will introduce uh, Rockwell if you're not familiar. Uh, and Ramon for Ball Corporation. Likewise, um, he will no doubt introduce uh, Ball too. So welcome to you both. Delighted to have you here as well. And really looking forward to hearing your, your perspectives on this uh, too. So over to you, first of all, uh, Katerina. Hi, so good morning everyone and thanks for giving me the chance to join this very interesting exchange today. Yes, I'm here on behalf of Rockwool, uh, which is the world leader in the production of Stonewood product, insulation building, industrial, uh, horticultural products, uh, just to uh, mention some. So, okay, let me start from giving you some data to put things in perspective. The built environment requires a vast amount of natural resources and accounts for about 50% of all the extracted raw materials. And the construction sector alone is responsible for over 36% of the EU total waste generation. And that is why the EU Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan originally rightly identified the importance of recovery targets for construction and demolition waste. In particular, the Commission made a, com made a commitment, and I'm quoting, pay special attention to insulation material, we generate a growing waste stream. And this approach, of course, is even more important when we think about the ambitious renovation uh, wave that we are aiming at, to avoid that this is gonna become a waste wave instead. So, however, even if that was declared at the beginning, we are still waiting recovery target for construction sector, the way they are meant to be introduced by the packaging and packaging waste regulation. So allow me to comment the circularity, um, circular economy package and the packaging and packaging waste uh, uh, regulation, drawing a parallel from a construction product perspective. So in Rockwell we are, uh, or we have a strong uh, drive on circularity. And this is naturally due to the fact that uh, um, we are very durable. We have a durable product. Uh, we stay in use and performance don't change over time. Even over 55 years, our products are recyclable over and over again. And we even have our own take back scheme called Rock Cycle, which is active in uh, 19 countries at the moment. And moreover, we can also include um, other secondary raw material and byproduct from other industrial uh, through industrial symbiosis. And I'm talking ab uh, about more than uh, 60, um, sorry, 650,000 tons per year. So the introduction, um, uh, this introduction was not just to make a self-appraisal, self but just to say that in principle, we are happy and satisfied and ready to contribute to the circular agenda. But unfortunately, the regulation that we need to help us doing that are not. 
So, um, and if I should just frame what are the issues that we are mainly facing, I, I, I would say that the first big one is that we are lacking common definition and common assessment. So in other words, we are lacking a level playing field and we are boosting greenwashing because when you are lacking assessment and definition, then, then you give the space to creativity. So for example, we are lacking a clear definition of recycled content. I mean, you, we have one coming from the eyes, obviously, the one we are probably all referred to, but that it's, it's kind of controversial and subjected to different interpretation. Is my product in or out? For us, it should be in, because of course, by product is, for example, another way to reduce the use of virgin material, but that it's still to be uh, uh, decided on a on a final um, yeah common agreed framework durability we are lacking a definition of durability and assessment method and and I heard Mr Pellegrini and very happily talking about reuse and we are obviously um, on the same side but how can you reuse for example a construction product if you cannot determine durability of that construction product is that safe towards consumer to tell them just reuse it without knowing whether the performance is still there. And then, of course, um, we are also lacking a definition on what is a construction product that can be recycled and what is recyclability when we're talking about uh, construction products. So um, with these regards, for example, the packaging and packaging waste regulation, um, introducing the recyclability definition is for sure a step forward and even more then the packaging uh, um, shall be considered recyclable if it can be recycled at scale, because it means that there is an intention to prove that this recyclability is going to happen in, in, uh, in real life. Um, we believe that the regulation could have been better in recognizing that or not, not all the recycling process yield to the same quality raw material um, or can be done or to the fact that it can be done over and over again. Closed loop recycling is key measure to guarantee that more packaging products placed on the market are made of recycled material in a continuous loop and, uh, and, and, and keeping the same quality at the end of the day. Uh, while there is not also mentioning on downcycling in the, uh, in the packaging and uh, packaging waste regulation, which we believe there should be somehow a distinction. And then getting to my last point, um, I think that the, the, uh, the scream that we are trying to, to do here or to, to pass or the message that we are trying to pass here is that we need a more conduc conducive regulation together with targets. Uh, conducive regulation to enable harmonized extended producer responsibility, um, for example, like the one we have seen now in the uh, proposal of the regulation, to facilitate the transport of waste when this waste is meant to be recycled. And maybe we should stop talking about waste if there is a resource, is in fact a secondary raw material. And targets increase the cost of landfill, then on landfill for recyclable products. We see that the cost of landfill in many countries is so extremely cheap that it's not incentivating at all any kind of recycl recycling practices. Um, <clears throat> As I said, targets on minimal recycled content, material-based, otherwise there is going to be, a, a, let's say, a distortion because you cannot ask the same target to different product with different nature. So to conclude, conscious about the time, the packaging and packaging waste regulation introduce fundamental elements that are for sure bringing the circular discussion on the right direction. So we appreciate and, and also has uh, packaging users, let's say definition, mechanism, clear targets. Um, but let me also say that we hope that the construction sector won't be left behind or even worse, fall between the two chairs of the CPR and the waste regulation, because that is very much the risk that we are not going to be regulated anywhere. And again, as I said, we account for an enormous amount of waste uh, in the EU. Maybe green claims, can start fixing the issue we have on greenwashing, um, which is getting bigger and bigger and leading to market and fair competition. And ultimately it's against consumer protection interest. So that's our pledge. Thanks for your attention. Okay, that's great. Well, that raises both, uh, obviously the, the 
possibility, opportunity, and the, the need for uh, more circular economic uh, measures, but also very clearly some of the challenges and alignment issues between different pieces of legislation. I hope we'll come back to, to Marta, who may comment on that, but also uh, our, our colleagues from uh, the NGOs who will join us, and maybe they'll have a view as well. But conscious of time, uh, I'm keen to pass straight to Ramon and to hear from you um, and to keep the, uh, the game in motion, so to speak, if I keep that football analogy alive. Ramon, the board is yours. Thank you, um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ramon Arratia. I work for Ball Corporation. We are a producer of aluminium uh, packaging, cans, uh, cups, uh, etc and uh, uh, reusable uh, bottles. And um, I'd just like to, to piggyback on what Katarina was saying, because it's really important. Like, it's about definitions and uh, defin defining uh, the elements in the, in the full circle from, you know, we've focused a lot on collection, which is, of course, is what it starts. But you need to also start defining on, on sorting. And you need to find on. Uh, how each of the parts and the design of, of, of the products, each of the parts can be dismantled, and that means about design of the product, but also around how the, the materials come back, in, in which quality uh, they come back. So there are a lot of different ways uh, of re recycling, downcycling, in, um, and, and, and there are very little standards. Uh, so I like to piggyback on, on, on those. Now, I think that new EU PPWR, you know, they have a lot of positive things and it, it will definitely make Europe less dependent on primary resources, but also I will be, uh, you know, contributing to, 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 to the climate targets. And this is the two things that, that need to be uh, tackled. Now, we see a few issues in the implementation approach in the detail, which more or less could be relatively uh, sorted. Um, so, Commenting on our sectors on, on the deposit on the deposit return uh, systems, um, if we look at the positives, we're seeing you know we're very excited to see a proposal that is a, that there is a mandatory uh, DRS, and so happy to see our packaging aluminium cans uh, included. We've been advocating this for a long time, uh, and only with regulation and harmonisation you can achieve the the, the 85 recycle content. That, that is our target by 2030. This is not for one product. This is for the whole uh, portfolio, the whole production. And you can imagine how much uh, dependence you, and on imports you would cut if you have that policy. Uh, as, and the same thing for, for climate. Now, we are very disappointed to see that single-use glass bottles were off the hook. Uh, wine and spirits, the whole sector, you know, pretty much on the hook. And glass has the worst carbon footprint of all beverage containers. Uh, so we don't see that that you know we are really uh, looking at the full LCA. And sometimes we forget climate when we talk about about um, um, uh, about packaging uh, legislation. So I, I think we need to go back to what Sirpa was talking about, the PEF, and what Matia was talking about, looking at the LCA and really understand. Uh, you know how you know are making decisions based on on the overall of their uh, facts. Um, so we think that instead for for the EU uh, from a climate and waste prevention perspective, you know having a 90% separate collection for recycling target for all drinks packaging would be great. Um, and, and and we see harmonized rules for all 27 members uh, around implementing a deposit return schemes that would be. Uh, that would be really interesting. Now, obviously, um, we we understand that you know sometimes there are voices uh, and there are very uh, you know powerful interests uh, in 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 some sectors. So uh, we see that even setting a 90% collection goal for all beverage packaging, whether it is in DRS or EPR, I think that could be you know a, a sort of a minimum. In reuse, great news. Um, I think. You really need intervention to create the scale, <clears throat> but sometimes, you know, it should focus on where it makes environmental and economic sense. Um, the first thing is there is lack of environmental data. The, the reuse have been sort of uh, the strategy have been set more on 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 sort of hinges and 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 um, 
and, and gut feeling and, and read little evidence on where do we need to intervene, which sectors we need to intervene. We've just picked the sectors, hey, we are doing well on this, let's do so a bit more, rather than thinking about what are those sectors, especially those without the recycling path, because the reuse falls disproportionately on, on beverage because beverage is already good at that. So we think that, uh, and, and beverage is gonna be already covered by DRS. We're gonna achieve, for example, in aluminum, over 90% uh, recycling uh, collection targets, which will deliver 85%. And there are any in other uh, sectors as well, mostly on the food side. When reuse is the, frankly, the only option. Um, so we really think um, that we need to make, um, that we need to make decisions based on facts. Mattia mentioned Germany. Um, and, and, and the good case for reusing beverage. Today in Germany, there are more than 1,500 different bottles. 50% of the market share is on individual refillable bottles. So this idea of the of the pool bottle that is shared by different brands is 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 a, is, a, is, a, is not the full market, and um, that's why uh, we need to look at the detail. Very good, thank you. Well, I think a number of themes uh, keep uh, coming up here, notably uh, measurement and, and how we actually talk about the same data uh, and compare uh, like with like over a life cycle. Um, maybe we'll come back to that. One question we've had, which I'll leave with you, maybe if we have time you can, you can uh, consider, even if it's not an EU uh, lead responsibility tax, uh, would, would uh, taxing virgin raw materials help this in terms of an upstream incentive to uh, to to re uh, to, to keep the value of the materials in the in the cycle as long as possible. So we'll come back to that if we get a, a time at the end. But I am very keen to make sure we get uh, Joanna and Larissa involved, and I hope that they are both online and can join us now, um, and that we'll be able to hear hopefully first from Joanna um, and then from Larissa. I won't do anything more than just welcome you and give you the, the floor immediately, since time is obviously running uh, away with us. Really look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Joanna. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak. Um, I will, uh, in order to be complimentary to, I think, what Larissa, my colleague Larissa Capello from Zero Waste Europe will um, cover, I will not dwell too much on the packaging, packaging waste regulation, uh, but I will just summarize quickly that, uh, in our opinion, um, it is a good first step. Uh, yet it could have done better. Uh, and I wouldn't do my role of being an NGO very well if I didn't challenge uh, the, the way in which uh, things are developing. So we see a lot of uh, creative energy and a lot of detail being developed on what, uh, what concerns recycling, uh, recyclability, recycled content. It all makes sense. In a circular economy, recycling is basically the norm. So it's good that we get these details right, and it's good that we get collection rates up. It's good that we 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 foster product design that enables recyclability, uh, and it's also important that we incorporate recycled content. Now, in the wider scheme of things, uh, recycling makes sense and should be uh, the norm if volumes remain stable. If the volumes of the materials that we put on the market continue growing, then even if we have 100% recycled content, we will still be overshooting what the planet can carry. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, we think that, for example, in key legislation such as the packaging and packaging waste regulation, uh, there could have been and should have been a bigger focus on waste reduction measures and, uh, and reuse. Um, there, we, we see uh, some effort uh, with regards to tackling single-use packaging, uh, particularly in certain sectors. It could have, it could have gone a step further. Uh, this because in the wider scheme of things, there is today too much material in circulation and the EU consumes a very big amount of it. The material footprint of the EU in 2019 was of 18.9 tons per person uh, per year. Um, this is uh, the second biggest rate after North America, 
Uh, and so material footprint essentially uh, accounts for all uh, resources used from fossil resources to biomass to metal ores and non-metallic uh, minerals uh, that are consumed to meet the the product and uh, the, the product and consumption patterns of uh, European citizens. Um, this is uh, this is what. Well, the rate is huge uh, and needs to be reversed. Um, and so the circular economy in general is a tool to be considered to decouple resource use uh, and raw material use from meeting human needs. And um, as, a, as a result, uh, circularity or in order to, Im to implement circularity, we need to keep this uh, footprint that we have on the planet much more closer to how we are designing policies and what measures we are putting into place. And so uh, I would also like to make the relationship between uh, material productivity, which has ever since 2000, it has uh, declined and has been stable ever since then. And this is particularly relevant with regards to sectors such as packaging. Um, the, the, the fact that mo for most single-use packaging, the value of the material is lost to the economy after it is being thrown away, after roughly 20 minutes, uh, is, is not uh, a, a good trend. It's something that we need to, uh, to think about much more, and it's something that we need to reverse using the circular economy agenda, but also uh, getting companies to think about how to decouple resource use from meeting what consumers or citizens need. And so uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that vein of thought, uh, the idea being that sometimes it will require to dematerialize. Sometimes it will require to redefine ownership. Sometimes it will require to think about things in a, in a larger and uh, bigger perspective and not just focus on individual production sectors. Um, and so this is to, to kind of call also upon, uh, well, companies and industry to think about the market signals that are, they are giving. If the only value that is measured is economic growth or monetary value, then we are not actually helping to rethink the, the, the entire system and to, to ensure that our companies are fit for the future and for the circular economy. So what other uh, measures of value can we create so that we are ensuring that uh, instead of relying only on extraction and uh, production and then ensuring that uh, that uh, consumption is continues at the same rate how are we ensuring that for example someone who would completely redefine ownership would still be uh, considered a valued uh, and valuable economic actor uh, so what can companies do in that respect so i think Overall, the message is that, yes, um, uh, in terms of material footprint, we are not doing very well. We are, we are in Europe, we, are, we represent 6% of the world population, but we're consuming 17%. That's something that Europe needs to be looking into. And for example, uh, the ESPR, in our opinion, the eco-design regulation, should have as a main KPI the fact of driving down material consumption. Uh, considerably. Uh, but this obviously is also something that should be extrapolated to many other sectors and to the economy wide uh, to ensure that uh, as, it, as, as we move along, we stop overshooting what the planet can, can carry. That would be my message uh, today and I will Thank leave you. it to Yeah, Marissa. well, I think it's, um, it picks up on a, a theme we've had already, which is the importance of um, measurement and in your case, mentioning the material footprint as a starting point for that. Uh, which remains a challenge. Um, obviously, that's a complex issue, but thank you. That was extremely helpful. And I'm going to pass straight to Larissa, um, give you the, the chance to offer your views as well. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so just a short introduction about uh, myself and the organization. So yeah, my name is Larissa. I'm a policy campaigner at Zero Waste Europe. And we are a Brussels-based NGO and network of organizations working across Europe on policy, uh, EU policy, national policy, as well and local strategies to address wastes at source. Um, well, a general impression on the on the proposal. So 
it, um, as Joanna already mentioned as well, it has a, a good aim, a good direction. Um, it's it focuses on the waste hierarchy, putting some um, waste reduction measures, um, establishing reuse targets, um, proposing some bans for some um, problematic and unnecessary packaging types, uh, established good criteria for deposit return schemes uh, as well and for reuse. Um, but of course, uh, it would need more ambition, ambition if the EU is really serious in achieving objective of 100% reusable recycled packaging by 2030. Um, and also the devil are in the details um, of the, the articles and the requirements in there. So I think first the thing I would like to raise uh, is actually one of the, I say, is the big elephant in the room that nobody mentions about packaging. It's about chemicals. So chemicals are really not addressed in the legislation. Um, there are many studies that are showing that in Europe alone, over 8,000 chemicals can potentially be used in food packaging, and many of those linked to cancer and other serious diseases. Paper and plastic um, are the most used for food contact materials applications in Europe. So if you're really talking about packaging, we need to talk about sustainability and safety together. That needs to go in hand in hand. We cannot talk about sustainability uh, 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 separate from safety of packaging. Um, so this need, really needs to be addressed in the regulation um, and improved. Um, another point I'd like to address um, is about deposit return schemes and glass packaging. So I'd mention both here together, as um, also, also mentioned by Hamon. Um, Single-use uh, glass packaging is, had, is clearly off the hook from this proposal. So single-use glass packaging it's, has been proven to be has to have the greatest environment impact compared to other all single-use materials because it has a high energy consuming process. However, it also has the biggest potential for reusability. So a reusable glass packaging, for instance, glass bottles can be used from 30 times on average uh, if inserted in a reuse system. And also in terms of recyclability, if it's inserted in a deposit return uh, scheme in a closed loop system, it can also be recycled almost indefinitely. So why, why single-use glass is out of the deposit return schemes? Why spirits are not uh, included in the reuse targets? So all of this makes a lot of questions regarding, yeah, single-use glass not being addressed, why it should be because of its high impact. Um, when it comes to DRS, um, it's crucial that the deposit return schemes they are implemented to accommodate both uh, single-use and reusable packaging. It's not in there in the criteria of the proposal, and it's not only important for um, the for the achievement achieving both recycling and reuse targets, but also for the for the convenience of consumers. Uh, we already have technologies of re reverse revending machines or for deposit return schemes where you can have both single-use and reusable uh, bottles being returned in Germany and as well in other Scandinavian countries. Um, another point I'd like to make is regarding the definition of systems for reuse. So it's great that the proposal uh, differentiates well uh, what is a system for reuse because it's actually a sustainable packaging cannot exist without a sustainable system. So the reusable packaging needs to be inserted in a system. So it's great that the, the proposal refers to this system, but it's missing a crucial element that makes the, the systems efficient, which is the incentive to return the packaging. Uh, if, they, if there's no incentive to return the packaging, there's no return rates and the systems cannot be run effectively and smoothly. That's I'm not sure if you have seen the example of some pilot systems being implemented in France, for instance, for McDonald's, etc., um, where with really poor um, return rates. It's because there's no incentive to return this packaging. Consumers are, are bringing it home because actually when they go to the fast food like McDonald's, they are used to take the packaging home anyway. So they, it's, it's, a, it's a new change of habits and it needs to put this kind of new rules which 
for instance, incentive to enter the package, like a deposit, for instance. That will ensure the systems um, uh, it's well implemented and uh, effective. Uh, just, one, just briefly now, I'm afraid, since I'm, we're we're running into extra time again, and um, oh, sorry. I need to just give one person. I'm going to bring Marta back in at the very end, just to give her a, a chance to reflect. But uh, so, just briefly, if if you may. Okay, I will just finish uh, on reuse as well uh, regarding the reuse targets uh, being mixed with refill targets, and they should not be mixed. So the proposal defined defined refill and reuse separately because they are different mechanisms and the targets cannot be achieved cannot be mixed uh, because there's one way you achieve refill and one way you achieve reuse and there's different ways to calculate mixing both will lead to a huge margin of error and will lead to a not reduced data for reuse targets so since I'm uh, not have more, more time, <laughs> I'll end up here. Thank you. No, that's very good. You've covered a lot of ground in, in a short space of time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, by all means, stay uh, with us. We, we've got. Um, I'm going to allow us a few minutes of uh, overtime, so to speak. Uh, Marta, if you're there, I promise to offer you a chance just to reflect on what you have heard and obviously how that relates to the discussions in the council, in particular, that you're engaged with. If you're still with us, you can join us now and um, give your your reaction. I mean, it's obviously a, a wide-ranging discussion we've had, but we've we've gone from very uh, broad issues like material footprint down to some very sp specific practical questions and concerns uh, from companies, and as you've just heard from Yara and Larissa in, in practice. Uh, so very briefly on, on your side, any other reflections before we bring this to a close? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Very interesting to hear all the, these participants in the second panel. Going back to what Caterina said and Larissa also uh, on greenwashing and deposit schemes, uh, it also br it brings us back to the consumer uh, issue uh, on greenwashing. Of course, if we have clear rules and definitions it leaves less space for those bad practices. And we know imagination has no limits. So when you <laughs> leave a breach, someone can invent something. We Here in Portugal, we just uh, initiated a, a, a campaign last week against the greenwashing to um, create awareness uh, in the consumer it's done in uh, cooperation with the consumer association and it's linked also to the eu eco label and also on deposit schemes we had a, a, a pilot project here in portugal uh, for uh, bottles and uh, metal uh, containers and it, it's really important to act on these uh, um, on these issues and I'm sure this proposal will um, have an impact on both of them and we, we, we will stand in opposition on, in the council negotiations like I said before it's a, always a question of a balance because we are all committed to the same uh, final goal that, that that's clear to, to everyone so thank you Thank you. Well, that's uh, probably a very good way to, to conclude, actually. Uh, the range of points that have been raised and obviously that need to be addressed, discussed further and to uh, uh, you know, conclude on uh, shouldn't, um, I guess, cloud the picture that actually there is a large amount of consensus on the strategic goal here and some of the merits of, of that goal, uh, namely, obviously, addressing some of the shorter term needs that we have facing our economy and society in the context of many challenges right here, right now, but also the longer term uh, environmental challenges. And, and the circular economy is one of these areas that combines uh, these things together. If we get it right, obviously, and I think everyone is committed to the same uh, goal here, it solves many of these problems at the same time. Uh, but that's complicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, these issues obviously deserve the sort of discussion we're having today. Um, and with very pleased to have had uh, obviously the range of policymakers, businesses, civil society voices um, that we have with us here today. Um, I found it extremely interesting myself. I hope everyone uh, who's joined us has likewise found that uh, interesting and useful. 
and I'm sure we will keep uh, doing this. The task force itself is committed to doing that. Obviously, as CRSL, we're going to enable uh, that to continue to be the case. And we look forward to your feedback on any of the questions. If you've got more, please, as you can see here, uh, Tamir is happy to answer those and we'll get in touch with other speakers and participants uh, where we can help. Uh, and obviously, we'll uh, remain in contact with you all and look forward to, to another session like this. Um, I apologize if it's overrun and that's caused you any uh, issues with your future meetings. But like uh, like all good football matches, sometimes the best things happen in extra time anyway. So hopefully the last seven minutes have also been good, too. Um, and uh, yeah, with Marta, obviously you're involved in a football match now, as you know. Uh, so good luck. And um, uh, maybe a score draw is a good way to finish, though, rather than one winner or and a loser. So. Anyway, enough football analogies. Um, thank you again to everybody, all our speakers, everyone who's joined online, all my colleagues who do all the hard work putting this together, of which there is an enormous amount, as you all know. Um, and I wish you a good uh, rest of day and look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.